Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Carla Gonzalez. This is Interviews from Quito, the program where we explore some of the biggest challenges facing this country and the region. In today's program, we look at the differences of the left and the right in Latin America and how the region has changed dramatically in the last decade, especially after the political events and attacks that have taken place in Venezuela. So whose interests are behind these? What is the role of the U.S. in the political panorama? And what is the importance of the progressive forces in the region? To talk about this, we have Mario Ramos, a political analyst. But first, let's take a look at this video. Progressive governments ruled Latin America for over 10 years. But during the past two years, a dramatic shift of forces took place in Latin America, and neoliberal regimes regained power. Surprisingly, it was the people who gave the vote to right-wing presidents who won the elections in a legitimate way despite of controversial announcements and campaign promises. Jair Bolsonaro is the most important example of this. He gave xenophobic, racist and sexist speeches during his campaign, but he still won with a resounding majority. Ivan Duque in Colombia was radically opposed to peace agreements and dialogues, and despite the deadly consequences that the war between governments and paramilitary groups has had, he was elected president. Probably one exception of support to the right wing can be seen in Ecuador. Lenin Moreno, former vice president during Rafael Correa's government, was elected as president, thanks to the support and credibility that he had due to his link to Alianza País, Correa's political party. But Moreno surprised everyone when decided to start a lawfare or political persecution against several people linked to Correa's administration, including the former president himself. The most evident act of persecution is taking place in Venezuela, where Nicolás Maduro was elected as legitimate president. However, the opposition, supported by the government of Donald Trump and many international neoliberal governments, have started a campaign of hatred and persecution against him, and where some coup attempts have already happened. We will see in the coming days if democracy and justice are enforced in the Bolivarian country. So. If we can look at Latin America as a region politically, it's been a lot of fluctuations between left-wing governments and right-wing governments taking power for the past 20 years. How can we explain this? Well, it's not so much as a fluctuation. I think that Latin America has been through different historical stages of different kinds a stage of insurgence of uh, political and military character because back then there were dictatorships. There was no such thing as a democracy. So it was a stage of a military and political way of seeing things where there were certain successful processes while others were completely unsuccessful. For example, a successful one was the Sandinista. After that, when dictatorships stopped being in power, a democracy became in place and the left-wing movements had to change their political strategy, of course. And they had to learn about how to work in this scenario, a new scenario for them. As part of this, it was very difficult for them to learn political communication, political marketing. They were working with an old type of scheme, and these new political technologies were not learned fast enough by them in order to work in a scenario of electoral struggle. But at the end, they were able to learn this and the first successful process was the one in Venezuela, and then new ones also added to this. And finally, there was a stage where in different countries of Latin America, electoral processes were won. But of course, as always, imperialism and the right-wing forces had to find a formula, a workaround, to avoid this success from happening again. And as part of this, they were able to develop new strategies as the so-called soft coups 
as well as the legalization of politics and also killing the image of political leaders in order to transform the success of the left-wing political movements in Latin America. So we're going through an attack that has been successful in certain places, and this success has been due to the so-called soft coups, for example, Paraguay. The only successful processes where the right wing won in a legitimate way through a process of election. We can see the process of Macri in Argentina. But the case of Lula and even though Bolsonaro won the elections, this, this legal political attack behind trying to annul PT and the main leader of the party, Lula da Silva. So we need to understand all this together, this new political strategy, this new attack, and the left-wing movements have been unable to answer due to their own mistakes as well. So they have been unable to create political subjects in their countries. They have been unable to combat corruption in a radical way. And that's what the right wing has used in order to take away the legitimacy of the left wing, among us other matters that we could continue talking about. But maybe with this, I am answering your question. But you were discussing the, the errors that the left has done in the region. What were the main errors? We had very good uh, precedents. We still do have, for example, Evo Morales uh, reducing poverty in Bolivia like no other president has ever done. We had Rafael Correa in Ecuador changing uh, the institutionality <coughs> in Ecuador for the past 10 years. We had, of course, in, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, uh, all these places. We had Uruguay at some point. It was also uh, uh, from the left. What did they do wrong? Well, each case is different. You're speaking about the Ecuadorian case, you're speaking about the Bolivian case, and of course the case of Uruguay. In the case of Ecuador, we see that the elections were won. However, the president betrayed the political movement for which the voters elected him. It's a different case in the case of Bolivia. Well, the economy has been managed appropriately. There are different conditions there. For example, food blockade, which is taking place in Venezuela, cannot happen in Bolivia because the culture is different in Bolivia. They have production. It's not a complete dependence of imports, even of food, like in the case of Venezuela, which is part of the problem. In Bolivia, there are farmers and there's a culture of agriculture, which is very, very strong. So it's impossible to blockade food in Bolivia because, once again, the farmers are very important there. In the case of Uruguay, things are different because there's a specific political culture in that country. It's an Asian democracy. There's unity in the left wing with their own problems on the inside, with its white front that has its own contradictions, they have been able to continue with their unity. And this is crucial because what creates weakness is actually being divided, but they have been able to continue united. And this is a process which is not as radical that creates contradictions with the conservative forces or the neoliberal forces. Yeah, which was very different, for example, in the process in Brazil and Argentina, being the most important countries, the biggest countries in the region that were leftists. They had Kirchner and we, they had um, uh, Da Silva and, and Rousseff as well there. Why was it so different for them? Why couldn't they hold on to, not say power, but um, some sort of support from the bases as well? Well, in Argentina, Macri was able to win because the forces of the left wing and the right wing were never together. And the political strategy, as well as the electoral strategy, was not the best. People were tired of this, and there was also this attack related to corruption. This means that there were indeed cases of corruption, but they were unable to work with this only in the past uh, 10 years or only with the left in Latin America there was corruption. That cannot be possible. 
Indeed, corruption is not a problem of Latin America. Corruption is a global problem. And it's even a problem of the structure of the capitalist problem. We should wonder if capitalists can work without corruption. But this is a matter that we should deepen into, but with more time. The basic ways of working are related to corruption. For example, Odebrecht was creating corruption in the government, the famous case of Odebrecht. But the mistake is that the governments of the left wing were unable to read the strategy and face it in such a way where this strategy was not going to affect them. So, with the use of neuroscience and the psychological war and all these matters, this affected the voters. And of course, we see the results, as in the case of Brazil. Although Lula, well, they're making things up, like saying that he was given an apartment that never existed. But the power of the media is so strong, the psychological structure is so strong, the media is so strong that this creates a ripple effect. So they were unable to face the situation in an appropriate way because the tools in order to avoid the success in the elections of left wings are more successful today. Now, it's not about a planned condor to physically kill leaders. Now, they are killed through the media, their image is killed, and they also want to kill the idea of change. They want to kill the philosophy which is behind all this revolutionary thought, all this left-wing way of thinking. So it's killing in a different way, killing an idea. This is complex. And the role, for example, of the United States has not been absent all this time. We can't be naive to believe that all, um, during the whole uh, presidency of Lula da Silva and, for example, in, in Brazil, the U.S. was just stood back and did nothing, or in Argentina as well. We are seeing strong interventions and um, attempted coups happening, uh, for example, right now in Venezuela. Listen, Latin America has always been important for the United States. Here, the first military command was created. Here, the first military structure, TR, was created here. So, geopolitically, Latin America has been fundamental for the United States. So based on this, they have always tried to take control to continue with their hegemony. Because in this global scenario, they're losing power in other areas of the world. For example, in the Euro-Asian area, they have been practically expelled, mainly in Central Asia, with the problems they're facing in the Middle East, they're withdrawing from Afghanistan, also the war with Syria. So they're going back. So they cannot afford to lose Latin America, which is what can let them be a power in hegemony. That's why they've always continued intervening in Latin America. They have always done it, will always do it, they always find a way, a methodology, the strategies necessary to be able to keep their power and their allies, which are basically lackey governments. It's not the peoples, they're lackeys, lackey governments and lackeys that are willing to betray the interests of the region. Can we talk about uh, a mechanism that can protect uh, the people from Latin America, the left-wing parties and left-wing movements? For example, UNASUR, all these organizations that were meant to protect ourselves. Are they effective? Were they effective? Or can, can we be hopeful? The best Latin Americans have always tried to gain integration in Latin America because it's good business, because creating a powerful market is good business. UNASUR was not made up by the left wing in Latin America. No, this idea of integration was even started by right-wing governments. The Andean group, the Andean community, Mercosur, all these are integration processes that were created when there weren't any governments of love in Latin America. UNASUR wanted to take a step further, not only commercial integration, but also political integration. But the process of UNASUR also had the participation of right-wing governments, so it's not only an idea of the governments back then, no. But why are they wanting to destroy UNASUR? Because as I said, 
They want to destroy all the ideas, all the pillars, all the foundations that provide a aid to integration processes or new popular nationalist governments of the left-wing progressive governments here in this continent. So they don't want anything left of this idea. And regardless of this, even though UNASUR was not created by left-wing governments, they want to destroy it. So this is what they tried to do with this, of ending UNASUR and inventing ProSur, but when they speak about ProSur, they're following the same principle, the same intentions of UNASUR, there's no difference, but the idea is to keep UNASUR aside, because they have the so-called karma of being fostered by left-wing government, which is not accurate. What all these governments in the region? We have Colombia with Duque, we have Bolsonaro in Brazil, Macri in Argentina, coming elections in Argentina as well, but it's going to be apparently continue to be a shift towards right, the right wing in, in Latin America. They must be doing something well. Well, they're living their golden age. They are just starting to enjoy the recent defeat of left-wing governments. But either way, each case is different. The Colombian case is different to the Argentinian and Brazilian cases. If Argentina does think right, I'm speaking about the leftists, they will be able to recuperate their government. Of course, if there's no fraud, if elections are transparent. In Brazil, well, I think that Bolsonaro, with the few weeks that he's been in power, he has already made mistakes. He has already showed contradictions, even with the military, for example. The recent case where he wanted to create a base and the military were not okay with this. Brazil has an economy that was developed for decades and it's a nationalist economy that goes for development. So it's very difficult for Bolsonaro to get into the free trade government in such a radical way without contemplating the economic sectors, the complex economic sector of Brazil. So each case is different. And I think that if the party PT and the social movements in Brazil are able to correct their errors, they will be able to regain the government. The case of Colombia is unique. Just because you're a member of the Union, they kill you. And they've done this ever since the agreement was signed. And there have been over 300 social leaders. There, the opposition is killed, is murdered. So democracy cannot happen there. There's not a democratic model there. This is fake. There's a dictatorship that looks like a democracy. They kill social leaders. We're not speaking about people of the community that are there trying to defend their rights, trying to continue with the interests of their community, but they're killed. So it's a different case. And I think that the war in Colombia is going to continue. I think that the peace process has failed. Duque has no intention of reaching an agreement with the ELN. Colombia is getting involved and willing to attack Venezuela, and they don't understand that this can affect them. In this process, the processes in, in Colombia and Argentina, for example, what are the main, the main weaknesses, the main things that are going wrong for these, for these governments, for these uh, uh, parties, that might not allow them to win the next, for example, elections? Listen, if we take a look at the case of the last elections in Colombia, I think that Gustavo Petro did things right. He had a historical number of votes for him in Colombia. If the conditions were not as the ones that they have, where votes are purchased, where the electoral system is not transparent, where there's a strategy against the alternative forces that are trying to develop their campaign without being threatened, then the situation would be different. That's why I'm saying that Colombia is a very particular case where there's a lot of violence, a lot of corruption, 
where there aren't any democratic institutions of democracy which are strong in order to ensure transparent elections. And due to the success of Petro, now they even want to prevent his participation in future elections, just like the same case that has been applied against Lula now wants to be applied against Petro. Yes, with different ideas, but the idea is to prevent a new wave of progressive government in Latin America. And for this, any reason or any method, even though illegal, they consider it valid. Because this is what we see. There's a very a strong attack to hinder new governments finish, from like being progressive in America. How do you see all this, the political differences um, playing out in the specific scenario of an attempted coup in Venezuela, this attempt of the U.S. of, of changing the, the government in Venezuela? Do you see um, being it successful, the, the right wing pressing for that, or maybe some of the left-wing uh, governments can press on their side too? Mira. Listen, the strategy of the United States to create a puppet president is the strategy that is going to allow them to develop their diplomatic attack, their sanctions. The idea is to create the appearance that there is no such thing as a government in Venezuela, where there is a legitimate government and alleged legitimate power because all the legal powers acknowledge President Nicolás Maduro. So this is a strategy that allows to create this game of the pressure intervention that in the Venezuela. US puts on these governments, on Colombia, on, on, on Brazil, Argentina. As well. Yes, exactly. This government is a strategy is possible because the government, the right wing governments that are today in Latin America, are willing to do this. The Lima group is an ad hoc group. It's a group of friends that get together to obey the orders of their master, their states. But it is not an uh, international acknowledged structure. That's why even the OAS, the attempts of the United States have failed to carry out this policy of diplomatic isolation of diplomatic attack against Venezuela. It has failed, even with the OAS. The Lima group is nothing but an artificial group that they made up, that they used as a tool, just like Guaidó is a tool. They used it to interfere in Venezuela and destroy the Bolivarian process that has been attacked not right now, but for a long time. The process has always been attacked with coup d'etats, with attempted murders, and many other actions that have been taken in order to finish with this. And they will not be able to do it, because that's where they were able to create a difference. And like other processes in different America, they were able to create a political subject there, a political subject. And this is the one that holds the Bolivarian process, regardless of all the attacks. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, Mario, but thank you very much for your, your thoughts on this very important topic that involves all of us in Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've been talking to Mario Ramos on the right wing and the left wing governments in our Latin America and what both sides are doing right and wrong and what could be the future for all of us. Thank you for watching. This is Interviews from Quito. I'm Carla Gonzalez. Until next time.